Walker's Temple, and I lead our industry R&D solutions program as part of our worldwide go-to-market uh, team uh, at, at Amazon. And one of the fantastic things about being an Amazonian is that you're surrounded uh, with wonderful talent uh, and in deep industry expertise, like my colleagues, um, Barack and, and Neil before me. And, uh, you know, but one of these things is it constantly leaves you feeling a little bit insecure because I don't have a, a PhD uh, to put in front of my name. However, I do have about 20 years worth of experience helping customers migrate and modernize, um, you know, engineering R&D workloads and bringing the best of breed technology to do that. And I'll share just quickly one of my own personal anecdotes around that. And that was, uh, you know, Neil and, and Scott have experience working with NASA and some very big systems. I had the pleasure of uh, leading a global team responsible for enabling researchers worldwide uh, working on the Large Hadron Collider experiment. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about big systems, I can't really think of bigger systems uh, than that one. And, and specifically, we worked on the Atlas experiment, which was one of the largest experiments. So plenty, plenty of experience um, bringing some of the best of breed technologies to bear to deal with some of the most intractable uh, scientific uh, problems. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about what uh, AWS is doing to help enable customers to modernize research and development workloads. And specifically, we're going to talk about PLM. As Neil mentioned, PLM, uh, you know, really tends to be the, the center of truth, the single source of truth for engineering data for aerospace customers and a bunch of other industries. And so this becomes really a pivotal element, uh, especially for organizations that, you know, have a long history of product development and have, you know, developed a lot of integration. PLM systems are, are um, critical uh, to, to delivering new products and services. They can also present some challenges. So next slide. Before I jump in uh, to some of the experiences that we've had with customers around modernizing PLM and uh, migrating engineering data to AWS, I just want to quickly highlight on uh, over the past three years, some of my discussions with senior executives at large aerospace and automotive customers, a similar theme comes up and that's companies are increasingly global and their products are becoming increasingly digital. As Neil mentioned, it's not really an option uh, to do things the old way and build prototypes and pass spreadsheets anymore. Um, in order to remain competitive, you have to adopt digital uh, engineering best practices. So things like cloud, mobile, big data, social technologies, these have all impacted product development, uh, but there's new digital disruptions uh, things like leveraging machine learning, serverless, which I'll talk about uh, um, in a moment, that are forcing change even faster uh, to be competitive and, and release new products on time. So what we see is product and design leaders are now having to splice in this new, you know, I'll call it digital DNA uh, that incorporates new technologies, but also incorporates changes to their culture and processes that allow them to perform uh, or to, rather to transform into the top performing organizations they need to be. As an example of this, we hear from Gartner uh, that 65% of boards of directors believe that their industry will be completely transformed uh, through, through digital engineering by, by 2026. And if, if this survey were just with aerospace customers, I would expect that to be an even higher percentage. Next slide. So for uh, those manufacturers who are dependent on PLM systems, as I said, like, like aerospace was really the synthesis and origin of modern PLM systems, uh, it, migrations can look pretty daunting, uh, to be fair. There's lots of layers of applications, plus you know, a lot of those things have additional systems that are built on top of the PLM. A lot of those are bespoke integrations with other technologies uh, that you know, are, are in some cases fragile. Um, and all, almost always uh, involving large volumes of legacy data. Uh, the legacy data, of course, presents opportunity for design reuse, but uh, it's difficult to manage and access. And so projects involving PLM migrations or upgrades are typically lasting years, uh, you know, pl planning certainly for years, and they're incredibly expensive. Uh, you can build this, however, uh, you know, as uh, Tim alluded to at the beginning of this talk, 
the recent changes in our world are forcing manufacturers to uh, reconsider that approach and you know really having to accelerate their plans around modernization specifically to the PLM and so you know it's our pleasure that we work with a lot of customers to help them do that so uh, part of my role as part of the worldwide organization is to help bundle uh, and package some of those best practices and learnings to help accelerate customers unlock innovation uh, through a modern PLM I think you can uh, build that and then maybe go to the next slide. Okay, so you know what what do we hear when we talk to leading aerospace customers around their current product development practices? Neil touched on this a little bit. Uh, as I mentioned, their current on-prem systems, this is almost uniformly true, are inflexible, they're uh, poorly managed, uh, oper there's a tremendous amount of operation cycles going into managing those and upgrades take, take forever. Uh, so what we hear from our customers is that they want to modernize that infrastructure. And what does modernization mean? It means adopting some of the agile engineering best practices that Neil and Scott mentioned, which enables flexible and scalable infrastructure at the lowest level. Um, and you can see that on the right hand side uh, as infrastructure as code. And this is sort of that notion of one line change to code can completely uh, redefine the operational environment which your engineering applications are running. Running at low latency, uh, available in a global, uh, a global workforce, and then having these things being uh, fully managed, which removes the operational load on the IT teams. I find it funny when I talk to DevOps and uh, large, large engineering customers who you know, they ask AWS, how do we staff for the appropriate resources to make sure that, you know, we're, we can respond in an agile way to new business challenges? And um, they're usually surprised to hear me say, you want to hire lazy people. Um, and what I mean by that is, of course, they, they can't be lazy in execution, but they need to be lazy in intent. And what I mean by that is um, a, a really uh, top performing DevOps SDEs are focused on automating everything they can possibly automate uh, and simplifying everything they can possibly simplify. It's this relentless push to remove undifferentiated uh, heavy lifting and just deliver what's needed for the business. And so, um, you know, what we see on the left-hand side, of course, is these siloed IT operations to support modern, modern engineering practices, HPC clusters, as Neil was speaking about, VDI environments supporting CAD and engineering desktop for pre and post processing, shared file systems, and then all of those legacy um, applications built. But uh, at the same time, our customers are asking us to help them implement new uh, paradigms and methodologies for systems engineering, like agile, like multidisciplinary optimization, smart products, and concurrent design. And uh, really, in order to achieve that level of modernization, they have to adopt certain level of change organizationally and then uh, you know, leverage some of the best practices around uh, uh, you know, uh, modularizing uh, and breaking apart the monoliths that are currently in their environment. And uh, you can build that, uh, please, Tim. But what's preventing them from achieving those goals today is uh, they have uh, you know, legacy applications, uh, HPC clusters that are full, the, the queues are full, uh, people, uh, the, the business users are not able to keep up because they're so uh, encumbered with all of the challenges on operations to keep up with all the on-prem environment. So uh, Tim, I think you can build that and then move to the next slide, please. So what does AWS offer uh, here? And, and when I talk about you know, bundling and packaging and how ways we can help accelerate the mission, when we think about uh, modernized R&D, we're not thinking about just discrete workloads, as Neil mentioned, like HPC. But we're really comp comp comprehending the entire uh, uh, engineering and design workflow. And in modern uh, R&D environments, really that boils down at the highest level to CAE applications, as you can see on the upper left there, uh, like STAR, uh, Abacus, and, and Optistruct. Uh, electronic design automation, uh, as, as I'm sure you've seen in the news, silicon has uh, you know, gone through fits and starts like a lot of uh, core components. Raw materials like semiconductors are hard to get their hands on. So we're increasingly having dis uh, discussions with customers around creating their own integrated circuits. So EDA has become incredibly popular uh, discussion. 
um, the focus of this talk, which is PLM and PDM, single source of truth for engineering data. And then as, as Neil alluded to, the engineering desktop capability. Um, so AWS offers, AWS doesn't uh, produce software in any one of these domains, uh, right? We enable uh, customers to modernize those workloads by leveraging greater than 200 uh, services to remove the operational load for each one of those. Many of those services are um, well suited and tuned for e and workloads. And when we talk about modernization, modernized workloads are designed entirely to reduce complexity uh, for the IT staff that are uh, keeping those available for the business users, and then just making them more accessible and easy for the business user to, to experiment with, try new experiments uh, and, and start really the innovation flywheel which really is a whole nother talk. Uh, I'm happy to, to engage with if you're interested after this one. So you might be asking yourself, uh, great, you know, AWS can help me with migrating these discrete workloads. There's some, some um, uh, capabilities to get me going quickly to bring those workloads uh, to the cloud and modernize them. But you know, how do I integrate them? And so uh, if you look in the center box there, the other key component to reducing complexity is, is automation. Uh, as I said, we want those lazy DevOps. So the automation really just enables your teams to leverage AWS managed services to integrate, um, the, you know, best practice of integrating these workloads through APIs, but also to create automation, repeatable automation to test and validate the environment uh, to make sure that uh, these, these uh, individual discrete uh, engineering workloads are integrated in a way that provides a seamless experience for the business user. So what happens once you've you know, eliminated all of that complexity and you've you know, adopted more agile approach to engineering workloads? Well, then now you have the cycles available to go focus on some of the more innovative business ch uh, challenges, more intractable business problems, leveraging things like our machine learning uh, uh, managed services like SageMaker, uh, leveraging services like recognition and text, text track for voice and video, voice and text recognition, and uh, getting to that sort of end state around re-architecting and building cloud native applications on AWS, leveraging services like AWS Lambda. Next slide, please. So how does this uh, relate to PLM? And, and you know, wh wh what do I mean by uh, rapidly uh, adopting modernized practices for PLM, even for environments that have, uh, you know, uh, decades old PLM implementations with data integrations. Uh, well, the first thing that I want to mention here is for the integrations that we've done for customers and with in partnership with customers and our ISV partners, these migrations have taken place in a matter of weeks and months, not the years uh, that we'd seen with uh, you know on-prem um, uh, migrations to new PLM systems or upgrades. Uh, starting with our partner assessments, uh, our ProServe teams and our partners will work on a structured engagement, effectively modeling uh, what the end goals are and identifying critical stakeholders in the environment. Uh, migrating a system like PLM has a, a lot of dependencies on teams. So we wanna make sure that we get the right people in the room to come up with the common risks and develop a, a really tight uh, migration plan uh, that you know, addresses all of those. As part of that assessment, we're looking at things like, uh, the, what, are, what are the business goals? How do we achieve goals around governments, including platform, security, and, and operations? And then after that initial assessment through something like our uh, uh, PLM Align offer or working with one of our partner assessments, we move into the migration phase. And that's where you actually implement those best practices for integrations, uh, data flows, security, and performance. After the implementation is complete, uh, our partners and our ProServe teams work with your, your team to deliver uh, comprehensive documentation, training, uh, change management best practices. This goes back to some of the cultural change. And then really making sure that the executive team is set up to measure success over time and make sure that they're achieving the business outcomes. So with all that, as I mentioned, with all that operational efficiency, what we see for customers who have migrated and modernized PLM to AWS is they're now tackling some new challenges like integrating digital thread, uh, leveraging things like smart product, using generative design and um, uh, optimizing um, uh, workloads using predictive analytics and machine learning techniques. Next slide. So uh, 
Tim touched on this a little bit, but when we're dealing with customers in the aerospace uh, side, a critical element to that governance uh, um, assessment that I mentioned earlier is to really deep dive and focus on some of the uh, compliance requirements, not just for uh, customers in North America, but for customers all over the globe. Uh, PLM, um, you know, being uh, sharing sensitive IP and data across vendors uh, in, a, in a global environment becomes a critical element uh, of focus in migration planning. Uh, uh, so in this case, you know, it, we're leveraging AWS services to uh, quickly and securely deploy PLM using um, some of the secure uh, compliance that we've already achieved with these institutions that you see on, on the slide here. Okay, so that's some of the, the outcome, or excuse me, that's some of the background and planning. Now I wanna take a second to talk about outcomes. If you can go, go to the next slide, please, Tim. One of the great things about working for Amazon is that uh, for somebody who like me who's passionate about helping customers achieve business outcomes, the nice thing about working for Amazon is there's a lot of internal businesses that I've uh, been working on tackling these same problems. And uh, it's, it's our pleasure when we can work with those internal businesses and share those best practices externally to help ex, uh, accelerate our, our, our customers in this space. An example that I'll share here around accelerating product development lifecycle time is our Lab 1 2016. They're responsible for products like Echo Show, Fire TV, Kindle. I'm sure you have some of those devices in your home right now, or maybe many of them, as, as is the case with my family. Um, in terms of Amazon devices, they are a PTC Windshield customer, and they had that environment hosted on-prem. Uh, that organization, the Design Technologies Organization, actually supports a lot of internal businesses like Amazon Go Store, who's rev revolutionizing the way uh, retail markets work. Uh, IHM, Prime Air is one of the businesses that they support. And what they found is they just weren't able to scale their uh, the, the windshield implementation to accommodate a rapidly growing user base. And they wanted to implement some custom features that it was just taking too long uh, to do development activity. And so uh, I'm happy to report now they've migrated you know, over 5,000 active users that have day-to-day -day, uh, design needs being met by that PLM system on AWS and achieved as an example 3X in improvement in their uh, uh, speed to deliver new uh, consumer electronic uh, devices to market. On the end-to-end -end and digital continuity goals, um, you know, working uh, with customers like uh, NP Innovation and Fresenius, this is uh, where we've seen them uh, really ad adopt a, a novel approach to enabling collaboration between engineering teams. So uh, in the case of NP uh, Innovation, that's a Siemens Team Center customer, and they uh, completely eliminated the need for up upfront purchase of servers, migrated the entire PLM to AWS, and have been operating that as an infrastructure as a service. And we'll talk a little bit more at the difference for migrating PLM, uh, leveraging infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service in a moment. But uh, you know, really, regardless of where you are in your cloud journey, uh, there are uh, ways that you can get started immediately to accelerate. In the case of MP uh, Innovation, that was a 50% increase, uh, which is an exceptional uh, uh, outcome for them in bringing new designs to market. They also realized a 50% time savings uh, uh, enabling the search function within the PLM itself and 100% accuracy uh, improvement in their uh, bill of materials management. Lastly, on you know, the goal that we hear from customers around reacting quickly to uh, changing market dynamics, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, this example in a moment. I will dedicated this uh, slide uh, to Collins Aerospace, of course, now part of Raytheon. Uh, Collins had done a, a talk with us at one of our uh, uh, public sector partner summits. I encourage you to uh, check that out. We'll probably share a link or I'll include a link after the webinar so that you can look into this. But effectively, they were looking at on an outdated, they were leveraging an outdated platform and similar to Lab 126, uh, enabled to keep pace with the rate at which they were adding users and increasing the complexity of designs, they had to upgrade uh, to Dassault's Novia 2016X. Uh, in addition to this, of course, being a government supplier, they had to meet their sensitive uh, EAR and ITAR data requirements. Uh, they're, um, of course, uh, under contract with cybersecurity requirements with DFARS, uh, Defense Federal Acquisition, uh, regulation sy systems, and supplements. 
So the requirement was to uh, have a configuration of parts and technical renderings, host those on AWS, along with engineering workflows. Um, and uh, as I said, we'll talk more about the outcomes in a moment, uh, but this one is specifically um, uh, relevant given the level of DFARS controls that they had to implement uh, as part of that migration. Their outcome today uh, is, is 14,000 users migrated, and we continue to work with them to help accelerate uh, some of the innovation they want to provide on top of that, that building on top of Lenovo. Next slide. So uh, leveraging Neil's description of a vehicle, uh, or sorry, a, uh, a an inverted wing as the difference between aerospace and, and F1, uh, one of the customers that I get to work, I've had the pleasure of working with for over a year and a half is Rivian. So uh, Rivian is unique in that uh, they have adopted a complete digital transformation of all engineering and design workflows, including IoT to instrument their vehicles with connected vehicle, uh, PLM systems, uh, their CAE and HPC workloads, as well as engineering desktops. And so that full breadth of engineering transformation is unique um, you know, amongst uh, large uh, manufacturers. In the case of their PLM system, however, uh, it's pretty spectac spectacular outcomes. Uh, they knew that they wanted to modernize the PLM system, again, keeping up with a, a rapid increase in the total number of users that they had to accommodate on the system. And uh, in order to do that, they had to completely uh, redesign their on-prem uh, Dassault architecture. Uh, they wanted to migrate to the new 3DX-based experience from Dassault and allow users to connect from global, loca global locations. So what we did is working closely with Dassault and Rivian, uh, we worked to re-architect some of the fun fundamental services that underpin the uh, 3DX platform, uh, specifically Anovia. Using best practices for managed services, we were able to implement with Rivian a CI-CD code pipeline that manages all the infrastructure effectively giving um, their Rivian a, a 3DX platform that scaled based on the users they were adding. So they're no longer bottlenecked in terms of uh, you know, performance requirements resulting in having too many users on underpowered uh, architecture. We did this with RDS on the, uh, in a multi-AZ backend for uh, data and then leveraged Active Directory integration for identity management uh, for both internal users and suppliers. And here you can see a quote from uh, the, the technical leader uh, responsible for that integration around their ability to accommodate not, and not, uh, would not have had the ability to do that had it not been for the migration. So that's sort of the enablement from an operations perspective. If you go to the next slide, I'd like to cover off on something that is often forgotten when we have these discussions. Um, a lot of our customers really do think about AWS as a technology provider uh, and, uh, you know, Th that is absolutely true, but we also work closely to help enable those business outcomes. And when we look at the balance sheet for most of the customers we work with, uh, the uh, infrastructure uh, commitment in terms of their capital expense uh, pales in comparison to the uh, investment in the best in class tooling, like the software they're using for engineering. And that number pales in comparison to the uh, um, the um, operational expense associated with the talented engineers and designers. This is really the heart of where the innovative ideas and uh, the new uh, disruptive products come from. So really when we approach customers in a consultative engagement to modernize their research and development, we're focused on maximizing the productivity for those engineers and designers. Not only does it help you get to market better and disrupt in your industry with new products and services, but it actually ends up saving uh, much more money. And so this is an example uh, from Rivian where they experienced an average improvement in performance that translated directly into productivity of about 74% for the designers who were uh, leveraging their Anovia-based PLM, again, migrated to 3DX. Also, I didn't mention this earlier, but uh, once AWS helped Rivian migrate their PLM, that was done in collaboration with our ProServe and the Dassault Services team. But then uh, the Rivian team, their IT team, actually did the upgrade uh, to a Novia platform independently and is now managing that entire environment uh, themselves, including the, the, uh, the uh, platform 
infrastructure and infrastructure as code through CICD pipeline. Here you see some of the examples of speed ups with independent teams, for instance, loading full vehicle bomb assemblies, cutting down that by 60%. 60, 60 uh, that's not a common operation. A more common operation would be medium assemblies and saving assemblies, which are happening you know, uh, thousands of times uh, where we see significant improvements. And then again, like the Collins example, improvement in um, search operations, which is really common operation that happens within the PLM. When you take all of these time savings per team across a thousand users, uh, that gives us approximately time saving back to the engineering organizations, the lines of business, 200 hours per day. And if we take, this is an estimate, if you take um, you know, an average engineering design salary, I think we grabbed this data from Glassdoor at around 120 to 150K per year, that gives you, uh, you know, a total savings of, th uh, of 1,000 engineers and designers of 3.7 million per year. So this is really when we get into the, uh, in addition to implementing this PLM very quickly, having immediate business result back to the business. Next slide. So in order to keep on time, uh, I'm not gonna belabor, because I already talked quite a bit about um, the Collins Aerospace uh, example. As I said, um, you know, I, what we'll do is I'll follow up and make sure that we have a link to the uh, Public Partner Summit where you can hear directly from Collins who worked with um, uh, AWS team directly, and then also our partner Smartronics to uh, implement this migration. Next slide. So I, I mentioned a little bit some of the ISVs. Uh, if you're on this call and you have a PLM system today, chances are it's one of these three. Um, I should mention we're also working with uh, partners like Aris and uh, you know PDM vendors uh, like like SolidWorks and others. So it's not 100% representative on this slide to help accelerate migrations, but really these uh, represent the big three. So um, I, I mentioned earlier this notion of migration, what that means in the context of cloud. Uh, really what we see is a pattern of a uh, rehost, which you can uh, typically is performed as part of an infrastructure as service uh, deployment, um, replatforming, which is uh, leveraging some of the managed services for AWS like RDS, that's the platform as a service, uh, uh, column and then software as a service is really moving into the phase where some of our customers they don't really want to own the DevOps uh, capability and I think Neil touched on this a little bit uh, with Scott's question around um, you know uh, what the breadth of partners that you can bring to bear uh, for for modernization of some of these workloads software as a service really puts the whole PLM system in the hands of your trusted ISV so uh, Siemens Team Center X is an example in this space. Uh, PTC uh, has a, a similar offer uh, that's built on AWS. And that is for, um, you know, again, customers who don't want to invest in developing their own muscle around uh, DevOps cap capabilities. And then we work closely with, as I mentioned, we work closely with the leading ISVs to make sure that we're working on uh, reference architectures that are publicly available uh, that uh, show the best practices for migrating, leveraging AWS services to decrease operational complexity for the PLM and improve scalability, as well as uh, some partners like Siemens who have invested in developing an AWS industrial software competency, which is really taking it to the next level where they're um, developing uh, cloud native capability on AWS and then making that available to their customers, either through software as a service or through um, their professional services engagement with, with those customers. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So I just talked about um, a lot, uh, you know, some examples from customers who've migrated, as well as uh, some of the key fundamental elements in consideration with modernizing uh, your PLM on AWS. Uh, you might be thinking, what are the next steps? How would I engage to do this? Uh, really, uh, what we find is customers who are able to achieve uh, modernization of their PLM system, you know, really just starting off with a rehosting element can accelerate that significantly by spending some time thinking about who your internal stakeholders are, what are the current methods and metrics that you're measuring uh, success for your PLM system, where are those bottlenecks, and how, how can we really accelerate those through uh, joint engagement. Uh, then uh, working with AWS to bring in our ProServe team, we have a dedicated offer that is just for the sole purpose of making sure that we get a really tight migration plan uh, that takes into consideration integrations with other systems like ERP and CRM, 
and other data integration elements with on, on, ex, existing on-prem data. We can then use that uh, migration plan with your SI partner, uh, working with partners like Deloitte, uh, um, Accenture, um, and, and HCL to migrate each one of, uh, to actually implement the migration, or you can work with uh, our professional services team or the ISVs professional services team, as I mentioned, Dassault and PTC um, have services that are aligned with AWS to go implement that plan. So uh, I hope that's been helpful in understanding uh, some, some of the best practices and partners and engagement around PLM. Um, if, uh, if there's any questions now, I think we can probably go to the next slide, Tim, and uh, field a couple before we have time for to hear from uh, Barack to cover going beyond the next level of yeah. just PLM migration and really thinking Actually, about modernizing. We're going to have a little switch in schedule, but I'll have Tim come on and announce that. But before we do, okay. I have a couple of things that I'd like to, to ask for a little clarification. You introduced uh, the concept of undifferentiated heavy lifting, which is a very AWS uh, expression. Um, you also mentioned auto scaling, which just want to uh, customers to understand or attendees to understand that's both up and down auto scaling. Can you elaborate on those two things just a little bit? Yeah, sure. So, you know, in terms of uh, engineering workloads, as I said, engineers and designers are the biggest hit to your your budget, uh, your balance sheet. So, uh, really enabling a seamless experience for them to to bootstrap that innovation flywheel uh, comes from removing ineffective gatekeeping that might be imposed by traditional um, static IT environments, giving them access through great documentation and automation. Um, and then also on the operational side for the IT teams to be able to support that kind of an agile engineering environment. Uh, as I mentioned, th there's no way they can even address those types of paradigms with uh, traditional on-prem environments where they're having to manage a full stack, including you know, down to the, the hardware level, the uh, operating systems that sit on top of that, the applications themselves, and middleware to support that. And so, Scott, what I mean by undifferentiated heavy lift is automation, uh, leveraging managed services and AWS-based automation to remove the operational load on IT uh, to enable that agile experience without gatekeeping from IT to the bit line of business users.